Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Fly Me to the Moon podcast. Today, alongside our regular FM TTM podcast stalwart, Rob Nichols, I'm delighted to say we have a couple of special guests. None other than the notorious detective, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and his partner in crime investigation, Dr. John Watson. Welcome, Sherlock. Thank you. The pleasure's all mine. And of course... Dr. Watson. Thank you very much for the invite, Alex. And please call me John. And last but not least, Rob. Thank you, Alex. I'm very glad to be here too. I've watched the careers of these two gentlemen with some amazement. John, if I could turn to you first. Through the course of your adventures with Sherlock, you appear to have struck up quite a friendship. Is this what inspired you to write about the cases you've been involved in? We're not that friendly. He just cracks on about that in his books. He came round once to borrow a Phillips screwdriver. I haven't been able to get shot of him since. Now, he's kidding you, Alex. Yeah, it was a set of Allen keys, and I haven't had them back. OK, I can sense this is going to be fun. Um, I must point out, listeners, that Mr Holmes is currently wearing a smile as wide as his face. Speaking of fun, we have something very special lined up this week. We're going to open up the phone lines. So, if anyone out there has a mystery in need of solving, please give us a call. Well, that was quick. We have a caller already. Joan from Billingham, what mystery do you have for Sherlock Holmes? Hi, Alex. I'd just like to ask about something that's been puzzling me for years. Could Sherlock please tell me why I keep losing socks in the wash? The odd thing is, it only seems to happen in the winter time. I can go a whole summer without losing one. But as soon as it starts getting colder, one or two go missing a week. Ah, puzzle as old as time itself. Well, at least as old as socks and washing machines. Would you like to offer a theory, Sherlock? Do you have a teenage son? Or a one-legged lodger? No. Do you have a cockatoo, a parakeet, something like that? I have a budgie called Elvis. And you let him out of the cage and fly around the house? Sometimes, yeah. Well, he's the devil in disguise. Or at least your sock thief. Which way does your house face? No, so I'm just beside the town square, whichever way that is. OK, go into the back bedroom and take a look on the top of the wardrobe. You'll find your socks. Thank you, Sherlock. I'll do that. That was quick. How on earth did you work that out? In the summer, she'll have the windows open, so she keeps the budgie in the cage. Plus, her garden is south-facing and sees plenty of sun, so she dries the washing on the line. In the winter... When she lets the budgie out more, she does her drying on the radiators, so the budgie steals the socks. Sorry, Sherlock. How do you know the budgie took the socks into the back bedroom? The back bedroom will be the warmest. The budgie's a tropical bird. It's going to favour the warmest part of the house. Also, she should probably rename the budgie Priscilla. It's a hen. The budgie's female. Amazing. Not really. While we're waiting for the next caller... I have a question for you. Given the notoriety you've developed, what's the best thing about being famous? I get to go to fancy dress parties dressed as me. When was the last time you went to a fancy dress party? Well, I haven't, but if I ever do, I'll be sorted. (laughs) Oh, we have another caller. Pauline Cathcart from Stockton. What can we do for you, Pauline? My granddad died a couple of weeks ago. Oh, sorry to hear that, Pauline. Thanks. The thing is... Grandad left a will, but we've looked in every room in the house and can't find it. There definitely is one. His neighbours witnessed it for him. Did he not lodge it with his solicitor? I don't think he had one. It was a DIY thing he got from Smith's and filled in himself. Are you married, Pauline? No. Uh, And this is your dad's dad? He was, yes. It's under the carpet in his bedroom. Really? I'm round there now. I'll, I'll go and have a look. So it's a bit embarrassing. A bit of dead air there. Um, Come back, Pauline. Um, Sherlock, how did you come to that conclusion? He's giving me a bit of an enigmatic smile, listeners. I've got a feeling he isn't going to tell us. And you'd be right. I'm back. I found it. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Sherlock. Well, thank you for calling in, Pauline. Oh, and here's someone else. It's Joan from Billingham back. Did you find your socks, Joan? Hi, Alex. I just thought I'd ring in and tell you, I found all my socks. They were exactly where Sherlock said they would be. And it looks like he was right. Elvis is a woman. How do you know that, Joan? She's burned up the socks. (laughs) Brilliant. Thank you so much for calling back to let us know, Joan. You take care now. That's two out of two, Sherlock. We should make this a regular thing. I'd love to, mate, but lost wills and socks that have gone walkabout really are my thing. 
Fair point. I think you'd soon get bored. Get. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt, gentlemen, but the callers are coming in thick and fast. Dexter Hudson from Eston. What has you mystified? Hi, Alex. I've got one for you. I was off down the garden the other night to take the wheelie bin out, and there, in the middle of the path, is one of my prized pieces of borough memorabilia. Smashed to pieces. Oh, come on, Dexter, we can do better than this, can't we? If this was a chat about Borough Football Club's prospects, I'm sure we'd come up with something more interesting to talk about than broken crockery. Ah, there's something in this. This memorabilia, what was it, Dex? Well, it was a little statue of Brian Clough, a mini version of the one in Albert Park. Now it looks like a bag of gravel. Actually, gents, I know something about these figurines. There were six made by the same sculptor, sculptor who did the statue in Albert Park, a lady called Vivian Malloch. She did them so that the Clough family could approve the design. Mr Clough's wife, Barbara, was given one, as were his two sons, Nigel and Simon, and his daughter, Elizabeth. I think the other two were kept by the company who made them. They auctioned them off to pay for their time. You know, it was all done on a bit of a shoestring. How many? There are only six in the world, and now mine's broken. Oh, I'm gutted. Do you mind me asking where you got your one from, Dex? Not at all, mate. I found it at the car boot sale at Redcar. It only cost a survivor. I thought it would sit pride of place in my collection, right next to Alf Common's jockstrap. Uh, has it been washed? No, no, no. But don't worry, it's encased in silica resin. Now there's a Jurassic Park movie I want to see. Mm, Dickie Attenborough really missed a trick there. <laughs> <laughs> have you got a dog, Dexter? Uh, do. Could he have got hold of it? We do, but he's up in Scotland with the wife, visiting her sister. Your dog has a wife? With a house in Scotland? <laughs> Apologies for that. Yes. Uh, were there any signs of a break-in, Dexter? No, nope, not a scratch. Uh, Dex, mate, it's Sherlock. All right, mate. I'm sorry to tell you this, fella, but I think you've been burgled. Are you sure there's nothing else missing? No, nope. and I've had a whole box of signed copies of Bernie Stavens' autobiography sitting there. They weren't even touched. A box? Yeah, I'm going to put them away. I'm hoping they'll pay for our lad's university. How long is he thinking they're going for? About 20 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, um, and him a friend of the show as well. If you're listening, Bernie, we're sorry. Dexter, it's Robert. Was the figurine insured? It was, mate. Fortunately, I had the assessor out to look at my collection a couple of days beforehand. You look like you're mulling something over there, Sherlock. I am, Doc. I'm wondering why someone would go to the trouble of stealing something only to smash it to pieces. They might have dropped it by accident. If whoever broke into Dex's place didn't leave any signs, like he says, then it would appear they knew what they were doing. If they were after the statue, which it appears they were, they would have brought something to carry it in. That's if they wanted to steal it. There's a few ifs in that statement, Sherlock. There is, Doc. One's one too many. Dex, your garden path, is it lit? Do you have some sort of security light or something? I don't, mate, no. What are you thinking, Sherlock? Um, it's a bit too early for solutions, my mate. Gentlemen, this is fascinating. It appears we have a Holmes and Watson adventure playing out before our very eyes. However, I'm afraid we've run out of time. How would you feel about carrying this on next week? We can do. I'll probably do a bit of digging around in the meantime. You better count me in too. Excellent. So many thanks to everyone for listening and special thanks to our guests this week, Robert Nichols, Dr John Watson and Sherlock Holmes. Um, do you mind if I have the honour of rounding off with those immortal words? Yeah, mate. I'm not really sure what you're talking about. The game is afoot! Hello and welcome to the show. This week we're fielding an unchanged lineup. So, a very warm welcome to Fly Me to the Moon's very own Rob Nichols and our local sleuthing heroes, Dr John Watson and the inimitable Sherlock Holmes. Hello. Hello. Now then. So, Sherlock, last week when we spoke you were going to investigate this curious case about a broken Brian Clough figurine. Did you manage to get anywhere with that? Yeah, we did. Do you want to tell him, Doc? Uh, about what? Your examination of the crime scene or the tour of Dexter's single malt whiskey collection you both went on? The first thing. OK. So, um, Sherlock and I went across to Dexter's place to review the scene of the crime, so to speak, and found it to be pretty much as Dexter had described. We found no sign of a break in whatsoever. It was also clear that if someone had intended to steal the figurine, they'd have struggled to get back over the garden wall with it in hand. Sherlock also noticed a mark on the footpath that appeared to be due to a previous attempt to break the figurine. 
the conclusion being that it was broken on purpose and broken into very small pieces too. Interesting. So where do we go from here? At the moment, not very far. We don't have much to go on. We know the figurine was stolen. I'm pretty sure it was broken on purpose, but there's nothing to say why. Well, maybe our next caller can help. Reese from Grove Hill, can you shed any light? No, mate. I don't think I can. I might be able to shed a bit of darkness, though. I used to have one of those statues. I kind of inherited it when my uncle died. I think he won it in a raffle at a do at Marchant Country Club or something. You say you used to have one? What happened to it? Yeah, well, it was weird. We used to have it in a presentation cabinet in the living room, just gathering dust. Then, one morning when I was walking the dog, I found it halfway down the road, smashed to pieces. A similar story to that other lad, really. It sounds like some sort of curse. Or maybe we have a serial killer on our hands, a killer of figurines. Oh, thank you. Uh, that is strange. Do you have any other questions for Reese Sherlock? Sherlock? Uh, uh, yeah, Reese. This do at Martin Country Club, what was it for? It was a works thing. My uncle worked for a jeweller on Linthorpe Road or something. Um, is that the place that looks after the orb of Vianopolis and Gelder and Corps? That's the one. He mentioned that a few times. What do you do, mate? Oh, nothing exciting. I work in insurance. Right, OK. Thanks for that. I can see from Mr Holmes' face that he isn't going to avail us of his thoughts just yet. However, I do feel the plot is getting thicker. What better time than now to introduce our special surprise guest, Detector Inspector Lestrade. Oh, for... F see what happens when you mention the word thick. Button it, Sherlock. At least I can, fat boy. Gentlemen, gentlemen, what's with all the animosity? I thought I thought all that was the thing of literary invention. I don't feel any animosity. I just can't stand the clown. Let me explain something to you, Alex. Sherlock is a very arrogant man. I'm not arrogant. I just know what I'm doing. Gentlemen, please. I thought you chaps worked together. I thought you were on the same side. We are. We just have different approaches. He does his thing and draws his conclusions. I do, mine, I do my thing and draw mine. Then we chat about it for a while and realise that my conclusion is better than his. Who do you think you are? Sherlock Holmes. <sighs> this is interesting. What is at the root of this enmity, this vituperative abhorrence? Wow, Alex. It'll take me about half an hour to work out what those words mean. Look, Sherlock is a talented detective. Good lad. But he's conceited. He doesn't think the law of the land applies to him. He thinks he can ignore it and get away with it. It turns out he's not as clever as he thinks he is. A while back he got his fingers burnt and I had to lock him up. I knew the risk I was taking, but there was a closing window. They were about to upgrade their security protocols. I put my faith in justice. We're talking about Wad Whoppers now, the payday loan company you hacked into. We are, yes. That's how justice works, Sherlock. You break the law... You get locked up. What those gadgets were doing was horrendous. They were pushing loans on vulnerable people and then sending the heavies round to lean on them. They needed taking down. I agree. But there are ways to do things. Your own auntie was on their list. They turned up at her house. I ended up fighting in the street with two blokes who looked like they went out with the weather girls. It wasn't even raining. I didn't enjoy locking you up. You didn't enjoy it? You went on Look North to crow about it. You called me an evil hacker. We used to be mates. We used to play pool together at the forum. Oh, I never went on Look North. You did. It's all over YouTube, you and Mike Neville. Sometimes it's even you talking. Most of the time it's Adolf Hitler. I must say, I wasn't expecting that to happen. I thought since the inspector spent that time in hospital, you chaps had put your differences behind you. I can sense some real resentment, Sherlock. No, I'm, I'm not a hater. I believe in angels and fairies at the bottom of the garden. I used to believe that justice was about the greater good. Now I'm not so sure. The only thing I'm left with is logic. I see. OK, I'm afraid we've run out of time. And I haven't asked the inspector the question I brought him in to answer. Do you have a theory on what's happening to these Brian Clough figurines? It's obvious. It couldn't be more obvious if it was written in big letters on the side of Newport Bridge. It's an insurance scam. I mean, he has an insurance fellow round to value his stuff, and a few days later... Some of it ends up smashed to bits. Oh, do me a favour. Sherlock? If that's what Mr Lestrade says. Sounds like we have a potential solution. 
we've also ran over time wise so ladies and gentlemen if anyone out there has an alternative theory or indeed more information please get in touch i hope to see you all next week the game is afoot do you know what i'm not really sure where i got that from Hello and welcome back to Fly Me to the Moon. For the third week running, I have Rob Nichols, Sherlock Holmes and Dr John Watson with me. Hello. Uh, now, let me start with an apology. I've been neglecting our social media. I'm afraid I find it hard keeping up with all the technology we have around us these days. Sherlock, would you mind responding to a few questions we've received over Twitter? No, not at all. Thank you. Um, Offshore Red asks, do you think we'll ever live side by side with robots? No. Okay. Uh, Auntie Jojo wants to know if aliens have ever come to this planet. No. And finally, Kitty Cooks wants to know if there's such a thing as a mermaid. No. Okay, that's cleared that up. To continue the apologies, in all the excitement, we've been ignoring Borough Football Club. Rob, last season it was a little hot and cold. What happened? It was transitional. We changed managers... And the new bloke needs time to assess the squad and bring in the people he feels will improve it. We shouldn't be too downhearted. I'm confident about the future. Sherlock, you're a fan. What's your view? The inconsistency is down to Kritchev's theorem of chaotic clustering. It's to do with temperature variations within the stadium. It causes muscles to need more energy and saps concentration. Consequently, the ball ends up going where it shouldn't. That's really interesting. I think. Uh, is there anything that can be done about it? I doubt it. I just made it up. There's no explanation. It's just typical borough. I'm not a sports psychologist, but, but I think it's all down to an unspoken definition of what's acceptable. Because Middlesbrough don't have a glorious history, underperformance isn't seen as disastrous. At a subconscious level, there's a disrupting mindset with the whole setup. What do we do about that? I don't know. As a start, I would stop looking at points scored and league position. At the beginning of the season, you need to look at every fixture and decide how many goals you expect to win by. Hanging on to a 1-0 win against a lower-rated club shouldn't be seen as three points earned, but a failure, something that needs addressing. The team should compete against itself and let the league position do what it does. I think to some extent you're echoing the great man there. Brian Clough wasn't a particular fan of consolidation. Speaking of which, shall we talk about broken statues? Yeah, I've been in touch with the Clough family. I spoke to Mr Clough's son, Simon. He said his mum's copy of the statue was broken a few years ago. It was nothing to do with what we're looking into, but rather an excited grandchild with a football one Christmas. Simon's figurine, along with his brothers and sisters, were donated donated to various charitable causes over the intervening years. Now, this is becoming intriguing. Doubly so, because we have a caller on the line who's refusing to give her name. Hello, Sherlock. Kitty, I'm disappointed in you. Sorry, have you two met? Our paths have crossed briefly. How have I disappointed you, Sherlock? By allowing me to seduce you so easily. Seduce me, Sherlock? I mentioned the orb last week for two reasons. First was to expose Rhys Harker as a liar. Gelder and Cove never had anything to do with the Orb of Ionopolis. It's a grotty little shop on Linthorpe Road, not a crown jeweller. But also, mentioning it was enough to pique your interest. I was thinking, who do I know who collects trinkets? Do you have one, Kitty? No, Sherlock. You're wrong. I have two. Would you have acquired those from a fella called Dr Barnicott, who reported them stolen last year? I can't tell you that. Um, I'm afraid I don't remember. But I bet I can tell you what you were thinking. How much would you like to bet? A kiss. A kiss? How does that work? If I win, I kiss you. And if you win, you kiss me. Excuse me, could you two get a room? So, either way, I lose. You're not really selling this to me, Shirley. <laughs> Here's the thing. When I mentioned the orb, you were reminded of the rumour about that big old red ruby, the eye of Middlesbrough that was going missing at some point over the years. The story that someone had stuck a massive midget gem in its place. If both the figurines and the orb had been in that jeweller's shop at the same time, maybe the jewel got hidden inside one of the figurines. It might even have been Rhys Harker's uncle who stole it, but then in some sort of mix-up he ended with the wrong statue. How am I doing? 
reasonably well. Go on. I'm sorry, before you do, Sherlock, is it worth us telling the listeners what the Eye of Middlesbrough is? It gets mentioned in Dr Watson's book, actually. It's the precious stone that sits on top of the orb of Ionopolis. To my mind, the ruby is the thing that gives the orb its mystique. There are all sorts of conspiracy theories that surround it. Cheers, Rob. Thanks for that. Sorry, Sherlock. Please continue. You see, the thing is, rumours are just words, and words evaporate into the ether. They're not something you can take hold of. The information lies in the unspoken, in, in actions. Dexter's statue was broken on a dimly lit garden path, and it took two goes to break it. He was a tough old boy, O'Brien. If the jewel had been in the statue, it could have easily bounced off somewhere and been lost in the dark. The thief would the thief just wanted the statue broken. The thief might have had a torch. It wouldn't really have helped. The the beam's too narrow. The only thing it would have been good for is attracting attention. This is very interesting, Sherlock. It all makes sense, but we don't really know, do we? You could prove me wrong, Kitty. You could use that hammer you have in your hand to break open the statues. There's only four left now, and if the stone's in one, there's a 50% chance you've got it. I don't like those odds. Besides, you know me, Sherlock. I love beautiful and rare things. What? More than you love me? Sherlock, I love the chairman's chicken wings more than you. Uh, Chicken wings from other establishments are also available. Okay, Kitty. There is a way we can check it without breaking them. How? Are your statues identical? Yeah. I mean, are they exactly the same? If you were going to hide a gem in one of the six statues, you'd need something to differentiate between them. A small nick in the base, something like that. No. Nope. There's nothing like that. They're all, they are identical. Then you don't have the jewel. No, that is a pity. I think I'd better be off now, Sherlock. Stuff to do. I'll see you later. Maybe. And with that, she was gone. Sherlock, you've not told us what did happen. Do we have time? Of course. It was Rhys Harker. He stole Dexter's statue and purposefully smashed it on his own garden path. The chap who also had a figurine stolen and smashed. We only have his word for that. What will become clear is that not only did Rhys work in insurance, but... He was, the also the, he was also the fellow that assessed Dexter's collection. So why would you ring in and draw attention to yourself? As soon as we started talking about it on the radio, he was rumbled. If it wasn't for this show, he would have gotten away with it. No one would have thought much about it. Dexter would have got his insurance money and it would have been filed away, all good. But now, he's the obvious suspect. He was in Dexter's house. He has a statue himself. Dexter's statue being broken makes his copy more valuable. Every one of his insurance mates will realise that. But still, Sherlock, it's a risky strategy. It is, it is, but it's the only one he has available. All he can do is make himself more obvious, too obvious. It's just the type of dummy that would send Lestrade spinning off in the wrong direction. The thing that tripped him up was his story. It was the same story that Dexter told. He came up with it in too much of a hurry. I'm still not convinced. Oh, come on, Doc, I thought we were a team. We are. Convince me. How much do you think those statues are worth? I don't know. £10,000 each? Let's call it 20 If someone burgled Dexter's gaff without leaving a single sign of a break-in, would that not suggest they were pretty special at the job? Probably. Yes. Arthur Raffles isn't going to get out of bed for 20 grand, is he? This wasn't a professional job. It was simpler than that. It was opportunistic. Reese lifted Dexter's wife's key when he was doing his assessor stuff. He's probably been back since to hang it back on the hook. There was no burglary. Rhys just waited for Dexter to go to the pub and let himself in. It all makes sense, Sherlock, but we have no tangible proof. No. Given this is going out live, we've also tipped off Rhys Harker. We have. However, before we came on air, I had a word with uh, Detective Inspector Lestrade. As we're speaking, some of his lads are over at Rhys Harker's place rooting around in his loft. I'll bet you Alf Commons jockstrap in the back of that loft... Wrapped up in an old T-shirt, they'll find a little statue of Brian Howard Clough, my hero. Sorry, gentlemen, we seem to have a caller. Hiya, Alex. It's Lestrade. The lads have been round Arca's place and have found a figurine. It was just where Sherlock said it would be, stuffed in the back of the loft. 
he's given us a full confession. He broke into Dexter's Hudson's place and smashed the cluffy. His plan was to sit on his copy for a few years and watch it grow in value. <laughs> Case closed, I think. Thank you, Inspector. Many thanks for letting us know. <laughs> no worries, mate. Give my love to Sherlock, will you? That's amazing. How? Not really. Winning two European Cups with Nottingham Forest. I'm That's of, amazing. I'm out of breath and we're out of time. So thank you, Sherlock Holmes, John Watson and my old mate Rob Nichols. We'll see you all next time. Have a good week. Cheers, everyone. Come, Come on, Bora. Open up the Bora. The Six Cluffies was written by Mel Small and featured Jacob Ditchburn as Sherlock Holmes, Ivor Lehman as John Watson, Wendy Gosling as Joan Charlton and Kitty, Tony Curlew as Inspector Lestrade, Gordon Smeal as Reese Harker, Pete Martin as Dexter Hudson, Sophie as Pauline Cathcart, Rob Nichols played himself, as did Alex Lefchuk, and the door slammer and writer was... Me, Mel Small. The Six Cluffies was a Southside Broadcasting production. Copyright 2018. Come on, Bora! Open up the Bora!